retreat this evening, we're going to do some talk story time with the presiding bishop. The cathedral was founded by King Kamehameha and Queen Emma as part of the founding of the church, with the cornerstone stone being laid in 1867. Part of the vision of the king and queen was to provide for the community, both in terms of the hospital, the schools, Iolani and St. Andrew's Priory, now St. Andrew's Schools, and of the cathedral, an opportunity to share with the world. We're gathered this evening because of the beneficence of a family. The Peggy Kai Lecture Series was founded in honor of, of Peggy Kai uh, in the mid-1980s. And her daughter, Anne Millard, can't be with us this evening, but the Millards carry on the tradition of the Kai Lecture Series. So we're grateful for the opportunity for you all to be here with us and with the presiding bishop. Now, in conversation <coughs> with the presiding bishop this evening is Barbara Tanabe. Uh, for some, uh, she's, uh, Barbara's name is always connected with her time on KHON, but she's also, in those years since, active in her own business, in work in the community, and for us in the Episcopal Church, she's part of the Ohana. Her mm. sister, Irene, was the rector of Epiphany and is now serving in Okinawa. And so oh. she's oh, part okay. of the family. Oh, wow. Michael Bruce Curry is 27th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He served as the bishop in North Carolina, and his ministry took him around the country before that. But you all need to know, and I think you know this, he has brought a new energy to the Episcopal Church in preaching about love and giving Episcopalians permission to say Jesus <laughs> in a way that we have not had in my lifetime, and my Baptist grandmother would be so proud of me. Oh. <laughs> so to both of you, thank you for letting us eavesdrop on your conversation. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop Bob. That's such a nice introduction. Um, I was so honored to be able to hear Bishop Curry uh, during the Holy Eucharist service this morning. And it is the first time I ever saw a standing ovation after a sermon. But it was, <laughs> it was magnificent. There were people laughing and crying and cheering. It was just wonderful, Bishop Curry. So I, on behalf of this congregation, I want to thank you. Well, thank you for your presence here. Thank you and everyone. Thank you all for coming out tonight, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so before, before you came out, I was able to ask members of the congregation if there were some dying questions they wanted to ask you. Uh -huh. And it turns out that many of them had the same questions I did. And it goes back to your family. Uh -huh. Was your family always Episcopalian? No, no, no. no in fact, um, when I came along, they were. Um, uh, my immediate family, my parents were. But both my parents uh, grew up um, Baptist in the traditional, you know, historic black Baptist traditions, the National Baptist Church USA. And, um, and so they, that was sort of the world that they grew up in. And on my father's side, his father was a, a Baptist preacher, and his father's father was a preacher we don't know of what kind, but a, a preacher. But he was a preacher. Um, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And uh, this, the family joke was he really didn't want to work hard, so he started preaching. But anyway, <laughs> it's and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it worked. And so both of them, their their growing up um, was in the traditional Baptist church um, of its time. Um, they became um, actually with my mother, who became an Episcopalian. She was um, I mean, she was a mathematician, and and she was. Um, studying at University of Chicago, and I, I don't really know the full story except she met some Episcopalians, and um, she, you know, was a Christian. That wasn't the question, but I think she was searching. She was what we would call a seeker now, already a Christian, but seeking kind of a home um, for her. And um, I mean, she was really very bright, a lot brighter than I, my sister got the bright, the brain genes. I'm, I'm just ordinary country preacher, but she got the brain genes. Um, and, and she was a, sort of a logical, rational person, and someone gave her um, uh, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Uh -huh. And C.S. Lewis's approach to faith, um, a, a very a logical, um, um, rational without being rationalistic, 
but that approach um, really captivated her. And, and she became in, interested in the Episcopal Church through that and eventually was confirmed um, in, in Chicago. Um, in Chicago. And she was teaching at Wilberforce University, uh, which was um, and still is a historically black college and university in, uh, in Ohio. And my father had gone there for undergrad, but he was studying at the Divinity School at the time. And that's when they met. She was teaching in the undergrad school, and, and he was um, in a seminary. Uh, but he was Baptist, and was, he was licensed to preach. He wasn't actually ordained um, in the Baptist tradition at that point. And they, they met, and at some point they started dating. Now, I don't know all the details on, on that, but they started dating. And somehow they, um, she invited him to come to church with her. And um, she went, this is near Xenia, Ohio. Um, and uh, so he went. And uh, this is in the late 40s, I would think. Um, and he went with her to, to church and had never been in, a, he had never been in an Episcopal church. And was it a mixed congregation? No, no, it really, well, maybe a little bit, but it really, the day they were there, at least, the way he used to tell the story was, no, they were the only black people in the congregation. And so um, those are the days when, um, um, some of you may remember in the Episcopal church, um, you came up and you knelt at the communion rail and, and the priest, we didn't have uh, the Eucharistic ministers like we have now. So the priest was the only one giving out communion and the priest would go along the rail with the bread and then would come back with the chalice and, and that was sort of the way it happened. And everybody knelt down to receive. Well, um, in those days, remember, this was before um, the ecumenical movement where any baptized Christian is welcome in the Episcopal Church to receive communion. And that sort of, that, that, that happened, but that happened later. It wasn't in the case in the 1940s. If you weren't confirmed you in the Episcopal Church or having been received from the Roman Catholic Church or the or Orthodox tradition, um, you couldn't take communion. So he didn't come up for communion. He sat there while my mother um, went up for communion. He used to tell us this story when we were kids, and you know how kids are. You're sort of like, oh, God, if we have to hear that story again. But anyway. But it's a good but story. I'm 66 years old, and I'm sitting here telling you that same story. <laughs> <laughs> and my kids say, oh, do we have to hear that again? But anyway. But, yeah. So he went up to the altar rail. Or she went up to the altar rail, rather, and he was sitting in the pew, and um, she was the only black person at the rail. And, and the priest, you know, kind of went by, you know, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life, take and eat this. And, and he would go from person to person. And daddy didn't pay much attention to that. You know, she took the bread and he kept passing out the consecrated bread to everybody. And then he came with the chalice. Now remember, if you're Baptist, everyone has their individual cup at when, when they have communion. This was a common cup and one cup and it had wine in it. Again, for a Baptist, that was, you know, oh, there's wine. And, and so um, the priest went for the chalice to the first blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for thee. And then the next one, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for thee. Be thankful. The blood. And daddy was watching. Everybody's drinking from this same cup. And he knew on either side of my mother were white people. Well, the one before was fine. But then the priest got to her, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he started looking to see what the next person was going to do. And the priest just kept saying, blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to the next person, preserve thy body and soul, and drink this in remembrance, and just kept going like nothing had happened. And when he would tell that story, he used to say that was the moment when he realized that he wanted to be an Episcopalian because he said any church, this is in the 1940s, southern ohio and this is when they had and separate water fountains still had all that going on jackie robinson you know yeah, was just starting out martin luther right. king was still in seminary he wasn't out yet brown versus board of education topeka kansas right. hadn't happened yet right. um this is this is in the day the heat of the night as they would say and he said any church where black folk and white folk drink from the same cup knows something about the gospel that i want to be a part of and that's how my daddy became an Episcopal, and why he became an Episcopalian, which is why I really believe this church, and churches like it, but this church has a message for the world in our time. And uh, so that's how they became Episcopalian, and I didn't come along for a couple that's, more years. That's just a wonderful story. Now, how did that affect your grandparents, your grandmother? You know, they I- They remained Baptist? Th they remained Baptist, yeah, they, they did. They remained Baptist. Now, my mother's brothers 
one of her brothers um, was an Episcopalian. I don't know his, they've all gone to, they've all right. gone to glory now. So, so, you know, when you're a kid, you don't ask them all the questions you should have asked right. to find That's out. That's right. But my uncle Ed had, and he and his family were Episcopalian. And I don't know how, old, I don't know the story there. But the rest of the family, um, on both sides, on my mother's side, the rest are all, they were all Baptists. And on my father's side, mostly Baptists, a few Pentecostal holiness, and then a few Episcopalians. And sort of one of the family jokes is that, um, you know, you, 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 you know, uh, you know, there's always going to be a meal after a funeral. And so whether, you know, when there's a family funeral, you know, when somebody has died, and it'll be a family funeral. Um, everybody knew that um, if, um, if, if somebody from the Episcopal side of the family, you'd be back from the cemetery fairly soon and get to eat while the food is still hot. <laughs> if it was the Baptist side of the family, the food might be cooling a little bit and you hope they put the potato salad in the refrigerator. Um, <laughs> and if it's the Pentecostal Holiness family, you might as well settle in because you're not going to see it till dinner time or breakfast the next morning. <laughs> well, that's a good way to be able to tell, you know, the congregations <laughs> apart. Did your grandmother teach you to sing? Somebody asked. My grandmother? Yeah. Teach me How to sing? Did, yeah. Why do you sing so well? Oh, you're very kind. You, well. Yeah, you are very kind. She used to, now my, my maternal grandmother, um, she used to, she actually didn't sing that much, but she was always quoting hymns. And so a lot of the hymns that are just in my soul, I just grew up hearing her talking about, I mean, hymns would pop up in the middle of a conversation. Um, I mean, you know, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh, what a fort. I mean, that could just pop up out of nowhere in the middle of a conversation. And, uh, but she didn't sing all that much. She was an, and Grandma was an interesting Baptist. She, she loved to be in church when people shouted. Oh. But I never saw her shout. <laughs> she, I think she just got off on the energy of everybody else right, right. Um, in the church. Well, it's just like the energy that you exude when you do your sermons. Oh, so, yeah, it was, yeah. Just, it was just really something to see the connection with you and the congregation. Oh, and the congregation was yeah. wonderful. This yeah. was just extraordinary. So in fact, they were so wonderful. I have to tell you, I, the, the camera folk had told me, please stay on the platform for the cameras. But I kept getting drawn to I, the congregation yeah. and kept wanting to go out. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, we talked about the various denominations. And the Episcopal Church grew out of the Anglican Church mm -hmm. uh, from England. And more recently, there was some concern because the Archbishop of Canterbury decided not to invite the spouses mm. of LBGTQ mm -hmm. couples. Yes. H how would you respond to that? Uh, w well, what, what are you going to do? Well, <laughs> thank you so much for that I, question. I just thought I'd <laughs> throw that <laughs> in. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I can tell you in the news business. I <laughs> no, well, you know, the, the House of Bishops, the bishops just met. Uh, Bishop uh, Fitzpatrick and I are literally coming from uh, the House of Bishops last week, I guess it was now. And, and the bishops um, kind of uh, created a statement that expressed um, our feelings that, that, that if you're gonna invite, if you're gonna have the conference, then invite everybody. That that, that was our perspective, but we respect the fact that it's not our conference, mm -hmm. that it is um, the Archbishop of Canterbury's conference and it's at his invitation and my guess is, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for uh, all of the bishops, but I th my sense is from our gathering that um, the American, the bishops from the Episcopal mm -hmm. Church, uh, for the most part, um, are likely to attend. Um, and, and some of the thinking is um, that we need to go to be a witness, uh, to be, that if we're not there, there will not be a witness for LGBTQ people there. I see. So, so you want to place our voice at the and table. our presence. Oh yeah, we're 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 on record, um, and 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 this is who we are. We are, I mean, and it's it's the the same grace and love that my father experienced in the Episcopal Church crossing racial divides at that altar rail in the 1940s. I believe is the same grace and love that calls this church to be a church that welcomes all of God's children as equal and full members of the community of disciples of Jesus Christ. I believe that in my soul. And I also believe, and the, this is also believe that those who disagree with us, they are just as welcome in this church as well. And I think we can carry that message and that witness to our brother and sister bishops. I mean, there will be some 800 bishops from around the world um, uh, who are part of the Anglican communion and that witness is, I think it's going to be important. Um, and so I, I would expect that we will attend, but, but we disagree. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury and I have a wonderful relationship. And we actually, when um, we were at the, um, at, at the royal wedding the night before, that we did um, some press interviews. And I, I can't remember if it was the BBC or not, but I think it was a British um, 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 journalist kind of said, um, literally the two of us were sitting there, and said, now the two of you disagree about um, um, same-sex marriage and about the, the role in place of LGBTQ people in the life of the church. How is it that you're sitting here, um, you know, in relative harmony? And, and we both were able to say, we disagree profoundly on that question, um, and yet we agree about the love of God in Jesus Christ. And, and the fact that we are both committed to Jesus Christ and his way of love um, makes it possible for us to be in relationship even when we disagree. And, you know, I think that's a message for the world. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I saw the news media just a little bit uh, on television uh, this afternoon, and there's all this hullabaloo in Washington about the oh, Mueller yes. report and all of that going on. And, you know, all that has to go on. I understand all of that, but the truth is we have to learn, in, at least in this country, but I think in this global community, how to live together with differences that moves beyond simply tolerating each other and moves to actually being in love, like the old prayer book used to say, being in love and charity with your neighbor. Um, to, to actually be in love and charity with each other as fellow children of God, regardless of our positions on a variety of things. And if we can do that, um, then we can make of this world a better place. You know, your, your message of love is so inspirational, but we also wonder, you need more than love. Mm -hmm. What about those who reject love or have not been loved mm -hmm. and do not understand mm -hmm. what it is to be in a community where love is the foundation? And we see so many instances where, for instance, immigrants are turned away at the border. Mm -hmm. uh, we have policies that look like they exclude people mm -hmm. rather than include. Mm -hmm. How do you address love in those situations? V very practically, you, you, you know, and, the, and this is where it, it does get interesting because I've spent, um, I spent a lot of time um, with, with representatives in, um, in, our, uh, in our Congress um, and when I was Bishop of North Carolina with, with people in the North Carolina General Assembly and speaking with Christians. I, I, I would be content if we could just get Christians to act like Christians. <laughs> <laughs> If we could, yeah. I really would. That's, <laughs> and, and so I've spent time with um, legislators who are Christian, and I say, okay, let's stop. Let's not debate the policy yet. Let's talk about the values that we hold and share that come from the teachings of Jesus Christ. And, and by Jesus Christ, I'm talking about the Jesus in the New Testament, not the cultural Christ. I'm talking about, let's just go to the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount, the Jesus of the, um, you know, blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit and the merciful do unto others as you would have them. Let's just work with that. And I want you, uh, member of Congress or member of a state legislature, in your fashioning of public policy, if we agree on the values of Jesus, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The parable of the Good Samaritan, when, uh, Matthew 25, Lord, when did we see you hungry or naked uh, or alone? When, uh, when you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, Jesus said, then you have done it unto me. So let's, uh, if we can agree on those values, then how do those values translate into public policy? Public policy not based on my prejudices or my opinion, but public policy based on the values that I hold as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. My experience is you have a better chance of finding common ground when you start from a values perspective and then try to work and fashion public policy that actually reflects the values of what does it mean to love your neighbor. And so I have said to members of Congress and others, um, how does the poli our policy of immigration at the border, does it look like the parable of the Good Samaritan? Does it look like love your neighbor as yourself? And when somebody says, well, we have to have secure borders, I said, I agree with you. We have to have secure borders. And what else? Love your neighbor doesn't, start, doesn't stop with protecting those who are in the nation. It, that's part of it. It goes beyond that. How can America be a nation that loves the neighbor who may be an immigrant, who may be a refugee? 
Um, and, and you can go on. My point is that we have common ground in some of the values that we share, at least among Christians, and to a great extent among the Judeo-Christian Islamic religious tradition, the Abrahamic traditions. And indeed, if you look at the traditions around the world, we don't agree on a lot, but we agree on a lot more than we disagree. I can actually tell you, one day I went in to see a member of Congress when I was Bishop of North Carolina, and it was around immigration issues, and it was specifically around immigration issues um, with regard to deportation in, in North Carolina and how some policies were being enacted. And, and so we, I was meeting with him and talking with him, and I said, you know, you need to understand that I'm the Episcopal Bishop, and this is something where Michael Curry, the Episcopal Bishop, and the then Roman Catholic Bishop, we actually agree. And I said, I'll give you even more. The Southern Baptists agree with us too. I said, I think you want to listen when Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, and Southern Baptists are all agreeing. And he jokingly said, yeah, I know the Southern Baptists were just in here this morning on the same thing. <laughs> Sometimes we actually do share values. Um, Islam has uh, ancient traditions of hospitality and welcome that are part of the core of the faith tradition. Judaism, I was, I was a sojourner. Um, I, I was an, a wandering Aramean was my father. That is that part of the basic creed of Judaism. I mean, the truth is, if you look at our religious traditions, there are enough commonalities that together we can begin to influence public policy in some positive and healthy ways. That sounds like so much common sense it's just it's just disappointing that we can't follow through on it i was just in the middle east and mm -hmm. i was able to visit palestine as well as israel mm -hmm. and i wondered why is it that between the jewish and the muslim groups there is so much animosity and even christians get caught in this you were able to study all of the religions do you see a way to resolve these centuries-old conflicts? Is love, the, mm -hmm. is love the potion? Is it going to work? You know, the ironic thing is that it is. Now, saying that's one thing, helping to help that to happen is another. I don't have a solution to the Middle East. If I did, I, wow. don't, I started really, to say I'd be yeah. Pope, but I don't know what I would You'd need. be a but prophet. I, <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> But, but the truth is, if we understand that love is not a sentimental thing, that, that, that you know, we, that's not what we're, we're talking about, um, love that seeks the good, the welfare, and the well-being of the other, sometimes even being willing to sacrifice one's own self-interest. But love moves beyond what Michael wants. I mean, we all have opinions and, I mean, biases, we all come from different perspectives, different groups, whatever that may, and so we all have, but love moves me beyond whatever my personal political perspective or personal biases or opinions, which have their place. The way of love is about, it's my job to seek what is your good? What is your good? What is the greater good? That's what love seeks to do. And if we all come to the table from that perspective, not from the perspective of just my tribe, my group, my religion, my politics, my country. Not for, if we move beyond that, what is the common good? What is the greatest good for us all? Then we might, then you have, you see, that's starting with the values. That's see what I mean? That's starting with values. Then we create space where there's actually some common ground. I was just talking with um, um, a, a brother here, a Stuart. I don't know if Stuart's still, oh, there he is. Oh, Stuart, we were talking about the environment. The truth of the matter is um, saving this environment, um, save it, that is in all of our interest. And we share a common value. Um, um, uh, John Kennedy, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when he realized that we almost blew ourselves up, we almost destroyed ourselves, said, you know, we breathe the same air. We drink the same water. We bleed the same blood. We are all human. We're in this together. So like the Bible says in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 1, come, let us reason together. Um, I really believe that if and when that can happen, and it's not happening right now. It's not. All but over that the is world. the only way. That is the only way there will ever be peace. I mean, that quote that I used from Jimmy, uh, Jimi Hendrick or... Or, yes. or William Gladstone, it's true. 
when the power of love overcomes the love of power, then the world, and only then, will the world know peace. But you also must put in there wisdom. Yes. Leadership. Yeah. Yes. And the ability to be selfless. Yes. And you say all of that mm -hmm. in your book, mm -hmm. and the power of love. Yeah. So sure. let, me, let me move on to politics, because you mentioned in your sermon when politics and religion and oh, economics yeah. mix, whoa, Look not out. a good sign. Mm -hmm. But there are so many people who, who use God or use Jesus mm -hmm. for political gain. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? Well, you know, one of the things that I found, um, it, it's really interesting, and, and this is where um, I, I happen to think that, that Jesus of Nazareth is the key to unlocking the real soul of Christianity again. And, and um, I really do. I, I really do. And I'll tell you why I say that. Now, I'm not talking about the abstraction of Jesus the Christ, the cultural Christ, um, or the Christ of culture, as H. Richard Niebuhr talked about years ago. I'm talking about the Jesus of the New Testament. It is very difficult um, to ally the Jesus of the New Testament um, with hatred, violence, and bigotry. It, it's very difficult. Now, what you can do, and this is what does often happen in our public discourse, and um, it happens at, at least in American culture from my perspective. Very often, you will hear far right-wing conservative voices um, that are religiously tinged will talk about religion but it is rare that you'll hear them actually talk about Jesus stop and think about the times you've heard a preacher arguing um, one position or another from the far right wing they don't talk about Jesus they talk about Christian they'll drag Paul out and misquote him and twist him around they'll drag in the Hebrew scriptures and uh, twist that out um, but Jesus is not helpful if you want to be a bigot <laughs> it's, oh. he, he really isn't and I've actually done a little study of that one I've, I was a while back I was actually reading um, some of the writings of abolitionists during the 19th century for the abolition of slavery and it was fascinating looking at the arguments most of the religious arguments rather the religious arguments in favor of slavery rarely if ever cited Jesus. They always would go to the Hebrew scriptures and misread those, but they would find some passages where there were slaves there, or they would go to the Pauline writings in Colossians and uh, Philippians and Ephesians, um, slaves be obedient unto them that are your earthly masters as unto Christ. Well, they would drag those out. You never heard them quote Jesus of Nazareth, you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. You never heard them quote Jesus in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus quotes Isaiah and says, this is what I'm about. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed. You don't hear an abolitionist quoting that. <laughs> and, and the truth is, I really am convinced that Jesus of Nazareth the New Testament Jesus, more, even more specifically, the Jesus of the canonical four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus will not, allow, will not help bigotry, narrow-mindedness, hatred, vile. That Jesus will not help that cause at all. And that's why I think that Jesus of Nazareth will help Christianity reclaim its soul as a religion grounded in the love of God for all people and all creation. That's, again, so inspiring. All your words make sense to me, and I keep thinking, but why is why? it that, yeah. that they don't listen or they can't understand or they can't implement their values in their everyday life? I mean, what can we do as just ordinary citizens, mm. as ordinary Christians, to be able to influence our community, our politicians, mm -hmm. and our businesses so that we do have this world that you are yeah. describing to us. Yeah. I think that's where our witness, um, both as individual Christians um, and as, as, as people in congregations and uh, various um, religious groupings, yes. um, ecumenical and interfaith um, groupings that seek the common good in a variety of ways. And I know that you're already doing a lot of that. 
um, don't underestimate the value of that witness and don't underestimate um, the value of your impact, of our impact potentially on public policy and discourse. Everything may not change overnight, but the truth of the matter is, um, you know, stockbrokers uh, pay attention to the market, politicians pay attention to voters. That's true, and we and, are voters. And they do, and we are voters. And, and, and they will take you seriously. Um, um, lobbying, um, or excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm told in church because we're a nonprofit, uh, we, we don't lobby. You don't lobby. We That's advocate. Right. We, right. Advocate. we advocate. So, <laughs> and, you, and you inform and educate. And you inform and educate. They actually will listen. I know uh, Bishop Bob has, has been involved in this. Our Office of Government uh, Relations, uh, which is the arm of the Episcopal Church, that literally our office is in the United Methodist Building, which is right next door to the Supreme Court and right across the street from the Congress. Um, so it's good location. Um, and, ideal. And yeah. it's ideal, it really is. And they are involved um, working not just as Episcopalians, but we work together with Lutherans, um, with the United Church of Christ, with the United Methodist Churches, with um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, um, with Jewish federations, um, with Islamic relief, and another, sometimes advocating for matters of public policy that have to do with human good. And we don't always, you know, it doesn't always work, but, but that you will get a respectful listening. And there are a number of bishops um, who've been involved and gone on Capitol Hill um, just pretty regularly, actually, um, and advocated for a variety of, of, of legislation based on values that we heard hold and you will get a hearing the citizen does have a voice and I think part of one of the things we get fooled about is that we don't the truth is we do um, and voting matters mm. um, being a part of the body politic in a positive way um, in a loving and respectful way not falling for the anger <laughs> um, and yes. the division but advocating for values that are not self-centered but that seek the common good that's a witness that does make a difference over time. It's important to remember that the great strides that have happened in our societies, none of them happened overnight. It took, there was a long buildup of people of goodwill who kept, who kept the faith and who kept working. And in time, there was a tipping point, but it only happened in time. The March on Washington in 1963 wasn't the first March on Washington. It happened 20 years before when A. Philip Randolph taking the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. My oh. granddaddy was a sleeping car porter. Mm -hmm. Took Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and they marched on Washington for equal rights during the Second World War. The one that finally got the nation's attention wasn't until 1963, but there was a buildup. You see what I'm saying? It was people who just wouldn't give up. I mean, one thing I will, you know, I, I'm not sure that Winston Churchill and I would have agreed on um, all of our public and political policy, but I love his spirit. Winston Churchill just said, you never, 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 ever give up. And in the cause of love and the cause of God's compassion and justice in this world, don't give up. The truth is, the good is, you don't want a whole sermon, but I can give you a quick. <laughs> <laughs> we, we wouldn't have Easter if Mary Magdalene and the women had given up they got up and went to the tomb on that Easter morning knowing he was dead. And they got up and they went anyway against the odds. They went to the tomb and lo and behold, Mary Magdalene and the rest of them became the witnesses to the resurrection. Jesus is not dead, he's alive. Never give up in the cause of righteousness. I saw it, was it 1992? Um, Archbishop Tutu was here, was here at the cathedral, um, and the choir sang just a lovely piece um, based on the psalmist, how a good and pleasant it is, a thing it is for, for brethren to dwell together in unity. Um, you know, I just came, I was in South Africa about a month, just about a month ago, and, and South Africa is struggling, um, as are all our nations, and has issues, but South Africa did not become the bloodbath that it could have become. It didn't, and it didn't because of people we know and people whose names we don't know, people who were black, white, and colored, people of all stripes and types, but people of goodwill and decency worked together and didn't give up 
until finally South Africa's formal structures and eventually the informal structures began to change and the walls of apartheid, like the walls of Jericho, came tumbling down. That didn't happen overnight, but it happened. And I really do believe that people of goodwill can do the same thing again. Don't underestimate the power of the people. Let me bring you back to the church. Um, there are so many people who are concerned that we have within the United States, but throughout the world, fewer people attending religious institutions mm -hmm. of worship. Mm -hmm. um, is it because they've lost faith? Is it because they look around and don't see a way to solve problems? Is it because there's no spiritual requirement that they must contribute to the society as a whole? Why do you think we're, we're, we're losing people becoming Christians or becoming more secular than religious? You know, I honestly don't know the full answer to, to why. I know that it's a cultural phenomenon. Now, the paradox, um, especially when you, when you look at and, and listen to younger generations, um, and I'm not talking about my, I'm a boomer. Um, and, well, and, yeah, we know, well, you, you know, you're talking about the young well, Right, I'm young going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real young. <laughs> when you look um, and, and, and listen to them and, um, and, and listen to some of the research of uh, Pew Institute and, and others yes. like that, one of the things that they found is that the level of public affiliative religiosity, that is, affiliating with religious institutions, that that, has, that is dropping, and that's what you're referring yes. to. That is yes. actually dropping. But the level of spiritual interest and concern has actually increased. Mm. So there's a paradox in that, which, which means, and, and I think there's a reason, I really do, I think there's a reason for it. I don't think it's an accident. I just think the spiritual hunger um, is deep in us. It, it, it's, you're not going to wipe religion off the face of the earth no matter how secular it happens. I mean, I remember hearing that story about during the Stalinist days and the days in the, uh, the old Soviet Union um, that, um, remember uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, oh, yes. Perestroika, and yeah, some of y'all remember Gorbachev, and the story finally came out that Gorbachev, who was really the advocate of of opening, opening up, up. Um, the Soviet Union at the time, um, his grandmother snuck him into church and had him baptized as a baby. Oh, you I can't didn't know that. snuff faith out. There's um, who is it? Archbishop Michael Ramsey, one of the Archbishop of Canterbury, used to say, "There's a God-shaped hole in the center of every one of us, and you can find all the substitutes to try to fill that God-shaped center, but nothing but God will do it." I mean, that's just who we are. Um, you know, was it Saint Augustine of Hippo said, "Our hearts." Are, are hungry until they find, our hearts are thirsty until they find their rest in thee, O Lord. I mean, that's, we, we were made by God. And we want a relationship with that God, even if we can't figure out what it is and how to name it or have the words for it. That spiritual hunger is there in us. It's just there. And secularism is not going to wipe that away. Now, the challenge, I think, is for churches and communities of faith to be able to reach those who have that hunger and to be able to help them find not fast food mm. but the gourmet of god mm. I've, the real thing i've not and heard that, god described in that way but i think <laughs> i understand <laughs> right 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 yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And that, I think, uh, the more we are responding to the deep hunger with a genuine encounter and experience of the living God um, in community mm -hmm. um, as, as well as in individuals, the more we do that, I think we're going to find ourselves connecting to new generations of people um, in new ways. And, I, you know, I, I, my sense is the church as we've known it the church is going to continue. I'm not worried about the, let me say it this way. I mean, Jesus started a movement. He really didn't start a church. And it was that movement that became church. <laughs> that movement of Jesus is not going to stop. It, it can't be beat. And so the church itself as a enfleshment of the Jesus movement, if you will, 
it's going to take many forms. I mean, you know, I used to say when I was Bishop of North Carolina, look, we've been around here longer than IBM and GM, and we've been around, we were here before the U.S. Constitution. In fact, we were around before the monarchies of Europe. The church has been around. This Jesus movement has been around, and it has been an underground movement. It has been, I mean, that's what it started out as, an underground movement. It was a sect of Judaism. It became an underground movement in the Roman Empire that was persecuted. Then it became the religion of the empire. Then it became the religion of all the places in Europe. And that it's gone through all sorts of, it's been through reformations. It's been through counter-reformations. It's been up, it's been down. Nothing's going to stop the movement of Jesus and his spirit in this world and people who will gather together in his name, which is what the church really is. We may take different shape and form, but the movement of Jesus in this world and people who gather in his name, which is what we call the church, mm -hmm. nothing's going to stop that. But our task now is to actually reach and help to feed the deep hunger of the soul. And as we do that, and as people experience us as people who are not selfishly concerned about our religious institution, but willing to give ourselves away the way Jesus did, we will have an integrity that will make others want to be a part of this. You know, just listening to you talking about Christianity, I was thinking if there are was a Muslim person in this congregation listening to you, speaking of this hunger for God, he would yeah. feel like I understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there is also a void in some Muslim communities. Yeah. And that's why in many instances, they are reaching for their own version of God mm -hmm. and they're being conflicted by others mm -hmm. who don't agree with them. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I quoted the, a book yesterday in the, in the talk um, that, that was by a Muslim woman um, who, who really is looking at Islam. I mean, this is, this is her faith, um, but looking at Islam and, and what she basically has been saying is, she said, wait a minute, we're allowing our faith to get hijacked, taken away from its real, real roots and its real source. That parallel thing is happening in Christianity. That, 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 that Pew Research and others have, have really documented that if you um, poll um, young adults um, and young people, uh, secular young adults and young people rather, um, about what they um, kind of do, a, uh, what do you call the old Freudian thing, um, you know, where you name something and people, free association, um, that if you ask them to free associate, when you hear the word Christian, what do you think of? overwhelming percentages when they hear the word Christian of secularized young people in, this is an American culture, um, what do they think of when they hear the word Christian? Narrow-minded, bigoted, homophobic. Not love. I, I am convinced. I don't think I was, I, I don't think I did anything special in the sermon at the royal wedding. I, I don't, in fact, I went over my time limit and everything. I, it, was, it was fascinating because I could see the security people on the side it was really funny because at one point I quoted the hymn, The Balm in Gilead, and I saw the security guy kind of bristle, and I realized he thought I said bomb. Oh. And, <laughs> and so if you look at the tape, I actually said healing balm, helping balm. <laughs> but, but the truth is the sermon, I didn't say anything that wasn't at the heart and soul of the essential Christian message. Why was that sermon of interest? I think it was interest of interest because Christianity has not dared to live and articulate in a dramatic and profound way the core message of Jesus of Nazareth, to love God and love each other, and you'll find a way forward. It's that simple. And it was like new. I was just amazed. This is news? Well, but, but that's because we haven't. I mean, I, and I yeah. take responsibility for that, too. Well, you were so animated, and your style, and your enthusiasm, <laughs> and your joy was, you know, the English aren't like that. Oh, so, they were so sweet. But yeah, I did, yeah. at one point, I was about to come out of the pool, from behind the pulpit, and I said, no, 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 you have pushed these folk far enough. Just go on back. So I walked back and just stayed there. 
But everyone, they were very sweet af afterward, after the service, and then we talked. Yeah, well, we were so <laughs> proud of you, uh, watching oh. you give that sermon. It just, it was Thank so you. American, you yeah. know? <laughs> 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 <You're> just... <laughs> oh. Yeah, it was really filled with joy and filled with love, and uh, your message, I think, got through. Um, you wrote, you've written many books, including this one, which I had the pleasure of being able to read. It's called The Power of Love. Um, and it really includes some of your sermons. Mm -hmm. Of all the sermons that you have given, can you look back and tell us what was the most difficult? Was it your first one? Was it when you were first starting out or when you looked out at the congregation and they were just all kind of not interested, not engaged? I mean, how do you do your sermons? Um, blood, at sweat, tears, agony. <laughs> um, but none of that comes through. Oh, yeah. It, it, I sweat over them. I, I, I still, I don't sleep I'm, on Saturday night. I mean, I sleep, but I don't really sleep well on Saturday night. I haven't for, for years um, yeah. as a parish priest and as a bishop. I, and to this day, I still, I, you know, it's, I, I can tell you one of the most difficult sermons I preached um, was when I was the rector of St. James Church in Baltimore. Um, I don't remember the year, but I was there from 1988 till 2000 when, when I became Bishop of North Carolina. And it was probably in the late 90s or so, somewhere thereabouts. And we used to have, um, as part of the parish, we would have an Emancipation Day. This is a historically black congregation and all that kind of stuff. And it's a large inner city place um, and right smack dab in inner city Baltimore. And um, in fact, if you saw the film, the, the TV show, The Wire, um, a number of the episodes of The Wire were actually filmed at St. Uh -huh. James. There were recovery groups that were sometimes filmed. They were actually in the old guild mm -hmm. hall of the, of the church. And some of the t times when the police were surveying, wa were watching the community, they were actually in the tower of, of St. James. But um, at, I can't remember what year it was, but we, were, we would do um, Emancipation Day, mm -hmm. um, usually on the uh, first Sunday in January, um, which usually is, which is the Feast of the Baptism of Jesus um, most years. Um, but anyway, we would do Emancipation Day because Abe Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st. And so we would wow. do a big thing about that and, um, you know, uh, read excerpts from the Emancipation Proclamation. And you could have young people do that. And it was really kind of powerful. And then the choir would, would sing, you know, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And it would, and, you know, it was, a, it was a wonderful um, kind of a celebration, a way of honoring the history of the place and of, of the people and all that. And we did that. And um, one year, um, in the late 90s, after I had been in the, in the parish for a while, um, I stood up and talked about what Abe Lincoln did, that he was a mor mortal, fallible human being, and he had his biases and all of that. But, but if you want to read maybe one of the greatest presidential speeches in history, read Abe Lincoln's second inaugural address. And I often wonder what would have happened if Abe Lincoln had not been assassinated. Yeah. We might not have had Jim Crow segregation. Yeah. America might have had a different history. You know, that, that incredible second, with, with malice toward none and charity yeah. toward all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. What if that man had lived? But anyway, so we celebrated that. And this particular year, I said, you know, he emancipated the slaves. And the Emancipation Proclamation didn't do it. The Civil War kind of did it, and then the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. But the truth is, by proclaiming liberty, he set the stage for the value of freedom to be reclaimed again. And that led to freedom. I said, who needs freedom today? For whom is freedom necessary today? And this was one of the, not the first time we had talked about it, but it was the first time I said to my congregation, we who have been oppressed and put down must stand with those who are oppressed and put down in our time. And in our time, gay and lesbian people, we weren't doing LGBTQ, we hadn't gotten that far yet. But gay and lesbian community in our community are, are folk who are being cast down and put down by religion. And we who have been put down must stand with those who have been put down because God made everybody to be free and equal. 
and we must stand. That, that was the core of the sermon. I don't remember the text. I mean, that's the part I remember. Wow. Yeah. And now I had been at the church long enough. I mean, I had some, had been, and this, wouldn't, this wasn't a shock to anybody. Um, and we had talked, you know, in other venues, but it was the first time I said that in a major, this is a, the church was, I mean, five, 600 people were sitting in there at the time. I mean, they were all there and, and they got it. But it was the hardest sermon because I had to speak a truth that I believed from the gospel and I believed was about Jesus to folk I love, but knowing there was the risk that they might not agree. And some didn't, I mean, some didn't, but they, they were able to get, because I've been talking about love for years. And um, anyway, so they got it, but that was probably the hardest preaching moment for me, um, mm -hmm. I think. You were asking something else, and I'm not sure if I answered your question. You did. Oh, you I did. did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I know that um, we don't want to take too much of your time because you're only here for a few days, but this was your second visit to Hawaii. Uh -huh. What did you think of it? I, mean, I love what Hawaii. Struck you, what struck you about this place, the people, the culture? There is a, I mean, there really, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I live in the South and, and uh, Stuart over there um, is a Southerner and, and uh, Mark over there is a, a Southerner. And in the South, you know, we, we pride ourselves on graciousness and hospitality. We, and that's true. I mean, it's true, but we, we have our ways. Um, um, but there's a genuine graciousness here that you don't see everywhere. Um, and I mean, that's, that's just striking. Um, aloha. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there is, there's something, don't, don't, Hawaii, don't lose your soul because there's something here. I'm telling you, there, there is something, something holy and sacred and of God in the spirit, in the soul here. Um, but I've also just, just struck, and, and the two times that I've been here, that this is a truly uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic um, community of people. And I know, I'm sure there are times when y'all all don't get, get along. I mean, that, it's you true. know, human beings are human beings. I mean, you put two human beings in the Garden of Eden and they're gonna cause a ruckus. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's just sort of the way it is. But, but there really is um, something remarkable about that, that you may be modeling um, in some respects what America in the whole is becoming. And I, I, I know that, that I'm sort of getting off, but, but I think mm -hmm. it's one of your gifts um, to the rest of the country and maybe the world that one of the part of the struggle that we're having around immigration, yes. some of it is legitimate concerns about appropriate respect for borders, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's appropriate and that's right. But some of it is generated by the fact that America is colorizing. Yes. That's what's happening, and that it's becoming. Remember the I'm going back in time, but remember the old Technicolor, the peacock that used to be on NBC. Remember, it was all these different colors, and all. that's what's happening to America. You've learned how to live that way, and that may well be an offering. It may be that Hawaii can help the rest of the country learn how we can live, as the prayer book says, in love and charity with our neighbor with all of the diversity and the variety, ethnic and, and racial diversity, religious variety and pluralism, political variety and differences. I mean, oh, that, that we can learn to live together. That actually, that's the American dream. It's not just my having my own home and a car. The American dream is that e pluribus unum might not be just simply a Latin phrase, but that from many we might be one one country, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That, that for, for all, it's, ex I mean, you know, America hasn't always lived up to its values. I know, good Lord, I know that. I mean, that, of course, it, but at least it had some. <laughs> <laughs> and those values, those ideals can point us in the direction of being that shining city on a hill. Mm -hmm. where there's plenty good room for all God's children. That's America. I mean, my God, I fly into, I still live in North Carolina. And, um, and so I go back and forth. The, the church center office is in New York. We're, we're right around the corner from the United Nations. And, and, and so 
you know, I go up and down, and I can, it takes about 50, 50 minutes to fly from Raleigh, North Carolina to LaGuardia in New York, and it may take you two hours to get from the airport into the city, but I can get there in 50 minutes, it's easy. But most of the time, depending on the approach path, most of the time when I come, we literally fly over and I can see that green statue. Oh, the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your yep. hungry, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And if you read that whole poem of, look up Emma Lazarus, the entire poem, it's extraordinary. I mean, give me your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And then it ends, I stand at the door of welcome with my golden torch. That's America, where people of many races and kinds can come and live God's dream for them. And you in Hawaii, you, you, you're getting it. I know you're not perfect. Well, maybe you are. I don't, but I, I'm guessing you're not. <laughs> but you're doing it, and maybe you can actually help to show us the way to be the kind of country and, by extension, and eventually the kind of world where there's room for all of us. Well, Bishop Curry, you are showing us the way. Um, we want to thank the bishop for sharing his thoughts and being here all these days and um, just giving us so much inspiration and so much hope and so much love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. God bless. Thank you, everybody. Oh, God bless you. And thank you. The bishop will be signing this book if you would like to um, come up and speak to him. Um, but I'm first in line. He's signing my book first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank okay. you. Okay, and then I guess some people will want to take pictures with you. We just stay open. You. We can do yeah, yeah. We can, um, right around here. Or what bishop do you Bob, where did you want the? Right next to the piano. Right next to the piano.